Let's go ahead and get started this evening. Uh, we've been uh, covering a series of lessons on rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, like I shared with you before, this is stuff that's helped me uh, understand the scriptures in more detail and have a greater understanding of the Bible as a whole. And this isn't uh, meant to teach you everything in God's Word, but it's meant to show you some basic guidelines to go by that are important guidelines. Uh, God's Word is written in a way that proudful men that already know everything don't learn nothing from. And that's the reason God wrote it the way He did because it's only through the revelation of the Holy Spirit that you can receive these things. Uh, that's why you need teachers. 2 Timothy 2.15 is our uh, focus. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed of rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the focus of this series of lessons. Rightly dividing the word of truth simply meaning to correctly separate the word of truth into parts. That's what the word dividing means, to separate into parts. So uh, we've covered that verse uh, each time we've uh, started this series of lessons each night. So we're not going to cover that in a lot of detail tonight. Just know that it means to correctly separate the word of truth into correct parts, into its proper parts. Uh, tonight, we're going to cover more about the natural man and the spiritual man. We covered uh, the last time what it was. Uh, what the natural man was, what the spiritual man was out of 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, the greatest chapter probably in the Bible on the resurrection, Paul lays out the fact that God acknowledges two separate men in this earth. And that's it. You're either in Adam's image or you're in the image of Jesus Christ. And that's it. There's no other options. Uh, when you're born in your natural state, you're in Adam's image, and it, it takes a new birth, being born in the image of Jesus Christ, which the book of Hebrews says he was the express image of God's person. If you wanted to see God, you couldn't get a better picture of God than Jesus Christ. Uh, Buddha statues don't give you a correct image of God. Uh, getting on a rug and turning toward Mecca, praying to Abba doesn't give you a correct image of God. But if you want a correct image of God, look at Jesus Christ. Amen. But when you're born, you're born in a natural state. Paul referred to this in 1 Corinthians 15 as the natural man. When Adam was first born over here, the Bible says he was made in God's image. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And when Adam was born, uh, the book of Thessalonians, first or second Thessalonians, I don't have my notes in front of me right now. The Bible says you're a three-part being. You're a soul, which is an intermediator between the spirit and the flesh. What you are is the soul. And when Adam was made, he was born alive unto God. He had a live spirit, and he had perfect communion with God. The Bible says one of the main things God has against this world is that they're separated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. God has something against ignorance of men. Ignorance is not an excuse. We even acknowledge that in our courts today. If you go out here and commit a crime, it's on the books. You don't have to know about it. They can march you in and charge you with it and hold you accountable for it. Ignorance is no excuse. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. But Adam had communication with the world through his flesh, and he had communication with the spirit through his spirit, the spiritual world. When Adam sinned, I showed you the last time how there was two deaths in the book of Genesis. There was one dependent on his 
access to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and one dependent on his access to the tree of life. After Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he lived over 900 years. But God said in the day that he ate of it, he would surely die. So he evidently died a different death. He became alienated from the life of God. Adam had a dead spirit. That spirit can no longer communicate with the spiritual world. Therefore, by the time of Noah, the Bible says all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And the imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. And it repented God that he made man. And he decided that the end of all flesh had come upon him. He told Noah to build a boat. Noah and his family got on and he destroyed all flesh from upon the earth. All right. remember, what, remember what God said too. He said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. For that he also is flesh. <coughs> So, that's what we're looking at tonight. We're going to look a little bit more real quickly at the natural man and the spiritual man. And then we're going to try to transition into the new birth. Okay? And then what takes place after that is important for us as born again believers. Okay? Now, 1 Corinthians 2.14. I'm just going to look at these scriptures quickly as I go through here. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them for they are spiritually discerned. Not only can he not receive them but he don't even know what they are. A lost man cannot have an intelligent conversation with you about spiritual things. Amen. It is impossible for him for one, he's blinded, the Bible says, and he requires a new birth. We're going to get to that. Although they <coughs> like to try. Yeah, they will try. <laughs> but he that is born in Adam's image cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man cannot know the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because the natural man can't receive them. He can't even take into his mind the things of the Spirit of God. There's going to be something blocking it. He can hear it all day, but he can't receive it. It becomes an incomplete pass, I guess. Uh, wide receiver goes down the field in football. The quarterback throws him the ball. Only once he grabs that ball, takes it in. Is it counted as a reception? But a, a natural man cannot receive or take into his mind the things of the Spirit of God. You can talk to him about them all day long. He will not receive them. Why? They are foolishness unto him. Foolishness, we look at this, Hebrews 5, verses 13 to 14. If the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness unto him, the definition of the word foolishness is resulting from lack of good sense. Now what's Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 tell us? For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Why is it important for us to come to church, read our Bibles, study our Bibles? Because in doing so, if we're saved, we're exercising our minds. I like to play golf. I went about seven years before I played. It was about seven years that I hadn't played. You asked Paul and Dad. I went out with them last summer and decided I was going to get back into golf maybe two summers ago. And by the third hole, because all I'd done since I'd gotten sick was sit around. By the third hole, this was the, the week of July 4th, probably the hottest point in the summer, by the third hole, while they're putting, I'm standing there like this. And I was like that the whole day. I hadn't had any exercise. <laughs> now I get out there and it's still some exercise. It's rough on me sometimes. But I can go through 18 holes and not have to bend over like that anymore. But foolishness is what results from lack of good sense. That's what the natural man has. He doesn't have good sense. His senses are dull. 
the natural man cannot know or have an understanding of the spirit spirit of God or spiritual things. They are spiritually discerned. Discerned means to perceive something hidden or obscure. Paul talked about over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 how that we, where we were just looking, how that we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, the wisdom of God, these things are hidden. God has hid them. God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, but that he is also his flesh. He corrupt. Verse, uh, Genesis 6 12. God looked upon the earth, behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Corrupt means evil or depraved. Look at 2 Peter 1 4. Man, I'm telling you, if you don't realize you live in a corrupt, depraved society, man. Maybe there's something corrupt to pray about you. I had a guy the other day tell me that religion was brainwashing. I said, good, I'd rather have my brainwashing than have it corrupted by the idiots running this world. Amen. <laughs> Second Peter 1 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know why this world's corrupt? Because people are lusting for everything they see. Right. Everything they don't have, they want. That's why there's so much bickering and debating going on in our society. And you know what? I watch these the debate shows on the news sometimes, and I think God hates that. You got four or five or six different opinions, six faces just sitting there looking at you, trying to convince you to think the way they think. It's the prey. But there's a condition with man that man is powerless to change. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Were by nature. Natural man, spiritual man. <clears throat> by nature were children of wrath. The Bible teaches us that if a man's not saved, he's not waiting on the wrath of God. The wrath of God abides on him right then and there. Amen. By nature, we were the children of wrath. How do you change your nature? Get a new one. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> but these people walking around thinking that they're doing something to earn salvation. And God told you when you was born, you were naturally, in your natural state, a child of wrath. Right. Mankind cannot be rehabilitated or reformed. That's right. That's why the prison systems are full because they keep trying to rehabilitate them. Well, we got so many repeat offenders. Now, start killing some of them when like God told you to. You won't have that problem. Paul's talking here about a man in his natural state. The word nature means intrinsic or fundamental qualities or characteristics. I'm not going to go through all them verses. I think it's pretty clear the point I'm trying to make. We're talking about the natural man, the spiritual man. Uh, let's look at these real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. A tragic situation was played out on the news for the last two weeks. In all their solutions they've tried to offer to keep these things from happening again, how many times did you hear God's name mentioned? Very rare. You're going to keep tragedy from happening to you without Him? Man's life is a tragedy. The older you get, the more you're going to see that play out, I promise you. Right. Man's life is a tragedy. It's horrible. <clears throat> it's a horrible, sadless condition. 1 John 4. 1 John chapter 4. The spirit of the world. The spirit which is of God. 1 John 4, 1 to 6, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we, notice this, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's the two spirits of work in the world right now. Amen. No other spirit work. Either the spirit of truth or the spirit of error. And in the Gospel of John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Notice this. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. I have no use for a church service that does not speak of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's not a church service or a denomination of church or a community church or a Family Worship Center or a Baptist Church or any other name you want to label it with that is led by the Spirit of God. Christ said when He come, He will take of mine and show it unto you. What chapter and verse was that? <clears throat> Gospel of John 16, verses 13 to 15. Spirit of error in First John, the people don't get about that spirit is it's not in the minority, it's popular culture. It's what you see on the news, it's what you see taught in schools, it's in our government. It dominates this world. Yeah. It's not just something tucked away in the corner somewhere. It's on TV preaching lovey dovey, hugging, kissy, tolerance for all man, and the whole world's falling in love with it. And it's a spirit, it's not a spirit of God. God said there's a time to hate. And this whole spirit of love, 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 love is, is not of God. Tolerate, tolerate, tolerate. It's, it's, it, it eventually equals a love for wickedness. And the only thing that in turn they're going to hate is anything that hinders that wickedness, which is going to be good. So that's what I see going on. Yeah. I can't even stunt to see most of them talk anymore. I really can't. <clears throat> Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Let me see what that is. I know what it is. I do. I already know what it's going to say. I'm sorry I don't have a genius mind. <laughs> That's the one about alienating from the life of God. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. What alienates from God according to those scriptures? Ignorance. Ignorance. But mankind has no choice to be ignorant. 
unless we get born again. That's what he says on down in the next verses. Ephesians 2, 11, 13, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past ye in the house of the flesh, who are called to uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope with God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus. Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Now, with the spiritual man, when a man's lost, he's in this state over here, he's got a dead spirit. alienated from the life of God through ignorance because of the blindness of the heart. Go back to the Gospel of John chapter 3. <clears throat> Just go watch the news. He'll testify to the truth of God's Word real fast. No matter how hard they try, things get worse and worse. Blood and guts and corpses. That's all that's on the news. Yeah, blood and guts, corpses. Uh, why did this happen? Why did that happen? We can all fix it. We can all come together and talk about it. And then two months later, they're covering another story talking about the same junk. And they never offer any solutions. <laughs> we just need to have a dialogue and learn to live together and accept each other's differences. But they don't accept differences. They don't know anything. Gospel of John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, He must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Here in verse 1 we see Nicodemus. In verse 2 he acknowledges that Jesus has come from God and that the miracles testify to him being from God. Right. <clears throat> and then in verse 3 Christ tells him, Jesus answered, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The new birth is essential to seeing the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, we'll get into this later, belongs here. It's a spiritual kingdom. It has different attributes than this one. I told a man one day these two kingdoms were different. He said, how do you know that? I said, because Christ said you can't observe this one. But he said to watch for this one. If one can't be seen and one can, they're not the same. They're spelled different. <laughs> yeah. One evidence they're different, they're spelled different. How's that, how's that fly with you? Okay. But you cannot see this kingdom without the new birth. It's essential. So how are you born again? Nicodemus assumes Christ is speaking of experiencing the natural birth a second time. <clears throat> Jesus tells Nicodemus, a man must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. What is that water birth? Natural. The natural birth. You can come up with all kinds of fancy ways to dance around it come up with fancy explanations as to what that 
Water birth is, but what do they say when a woman goes into labor? Her water broke. You're carried around, and like Paul says, in a sack of water for nine months. You're 70% water even as you walk around on this earth. Yeah, you're 70% water right now. I like what the, somebody told the evolutionists one time. Well, monkeys are very similar to humans in DNA makeup, so we obviously come from the monkeys. He said, yeah, and clouds and watermelons are 80% water, so clouds and watermelons must be from the same source. <laughs> <coughs> Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God flesh and spirit water and spirit water breaks at birth then you got flesh and spirit that which is born of the flesh is flesh but you must be born a second time of the spirit why? because spirit is spirit that which is born of the spirit is spirit so you can't be spiritually born unless you're born of the Spirit. Amen. Let everything bring forth after its own kind. Right. That's what he said in Genesis. I believe it is. And then he says, Marvel not, the wind bloweth where it listeth. You can see the effect of the wind, but you can't tell where it came from. Those born of the Spirit are the same. You can't see the spiritual birth, but you can see the effects of spiritual birth. And they're not shaving, fixing up your hair, and not still lusting for, th for things that the flesh used to lust for. We're going to see that in a minute. It amazes me how you got these guys that are constantly wanting to look for effects of salvation. And I hardly ever see him go into the Apostle Paul's letters and actually show what the effects of salvation actually are. Yeah. Those born of the Spirit are the same. You don't know where they come from, but you can see the effects. And in verse 10, uh, Nicodemus questions that. Christ says, Are you a master of Israel and understandeth not these things? How could Nicodemus not understand these things? They were natural things. What he told him over there about the wind blowing and all that stuff, those are natural things. Now look in verse 11. I mean, if I go out here and tell you, he that is born of the Spirit is like grass, and you drop the seed on the ground, and when it takes root, the rain comes. <laughs> Water falls on it, and the sunlight comes out, and that grass starts to grow. And you say, how can these things be? That's basically what just happened here. The wind blows where it listeth. You can hear the sound of it, feel it. But you don't know where it's coming from. Well, how can these things be? Christ said, how can you be a master of Israel and understand not these things? Those were natural things. They're trying to have a conversation about the kingdom of God, the, the being born again by the Spirit of God, and spiritual things. And even Davis gets confused about an explanation of how the wind blows. Yeah. Jesus tells Nicodemus he's simply speaking and testifying the things he knows and has seen. And Nicodemus received not his witness. Verse 12. He witnessed earthly things. Jesus confirms here that the witness Nicodemus did not receive was that of the wind. Jesus wonders if Nicodemus won't receive what he tells him of earthly things. How can he receive heavenly things? Nicodemus, if you don't understand the simple explanation of what the wind does when it blows, how do you want to understand if we continue this conversation about spiritual things? Verse 13, he says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Then he gives him an explanation of how Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness. And because I got a lot to cover and I want to hurry, real quickly, the children of Israel were bitten by serpents and they were dying. And Moses interceded for them, prayed to God. God said, take a brazen serpent, put it on a pole, hold it up. He that looks on it believes he'll be healed, will be healed. 
And the type and the picture in that is that Christ came down here. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Right. Amen. What had stricken us, Christ became. He didn't just come down here and say, oh, I'll die for their sins. He became every one of our sins when He hung on the cross. He hung there as my brother, as my dad, as uh, Chuck and uh, uh, Katrina, as Becky, as Bobby, as Janet, as me. He hung there as us. He became sin for us. <coughs> and that's what He likens a new birth to. Equivalent to believing on the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. Well, that's the new birth. That's receiving eternal life. First John chapter 5. We're not going to cover them all. Verses 1 to 11. Write these down. Go home and read them. First John chapter 5. Verses 1 to 11. I've read this. All the way down through there, he's uh, uh, talking about he that believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. We're talking about being born again, right? Here in 1 John chapter 5, he's talking about being born of God. And then down there, let's see here, around verse 6 through 10, he says in verse 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. They marched uh, over 30 some witnesses in the courtroom the last two weeks. And then a jury went back in the room and were to assume that every one of those people told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And they received the witness of those men. John says, we, we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Amen. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. It's just like God's in the witness stand. And he's done told us he cannot lie. And he's in the witness stand, and what's he witness? What does he testify to? He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. If you believe on the Son of God, the same thing God testified to will be in you. Right. That's what he's saying. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar. He that believeth not, God hath made who a liar? God. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son, they keep a record in a courtroom. That's what we're talking about, the record. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Do you believe that record? Amen. The witness is in you. Now real quick, we're talking about the new birth. Let me go through these real fast. I'm only going 30 minutes. You want to turn the air conditioners or the fans on? You know what this means? What? Chop, chop. Chip, chop, chip. Chip, chop, chip. Chip, chop, chip. I don't even know what that means. You want to turn the fans on? I'm good. It's well, fine. Everybody okay? Ephesians mm -hmm. one thirteen. These verses right here gave me so much assurance. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Verse 12, he ends with the word Christ, who first trusted in Christ. Then he says, in whom, who? Christ. In whom he also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. How did they receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit? I believe. 
after they heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, in whom also, after that they believed, they were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. They were sealed in Christ after they heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, they were sealed in Christ. What is the gospel of their salvation? Paul uses the same exact phrase, gospel of salvation, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We talked about earlier when he says the gospel of their salvation was how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, how that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now the definition of seal is something as a commercial hallmark that serves to authenticate or verify. Just like the state seal. I love that example. Why? You put that state seal on a document and it certifies. It's got the backing of whatever entity it's, it's the seal of. The state of West Virginia. That seal, that document has the backing of the state. It lets you know something. What does it let you know? That is backed by the state. Luke 2 Timothy, chapter 2. It lets you know something. <laughs> Seal on a document lets you know something. It identifies something. And here in 2 Timothy 2, look at verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. First Corinthians 12, 13. Write these down, check them if you want to. Don't check me. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Believing equals baptizing. We just saw that in Ephesians 1, 13. After they believed they were sealed. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. You're baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. There's only one baptism that puts you in the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's many baptisms in this Bible. There's the baptism of John. There's the baptism of suffering. Baptism of fire. Sit down the fire. I don't want any part of that fire. Amen. That's just a bunch of people tear through their Bible and they can care less what it says. Ephesians 4, 4-6. Baptized in the body, there's one baptized baptism that puts you in that body. 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22 is a great explanation of that baptism. They always run here, do they not? To try to prove that it's baptism in water. But Peter plainly tells you that the baptism in water is a like figure of something else. Right. 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us Parentheses. They don't read the parentheses. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. I've had people actually tell me that you can't get your sins washed away until you're ducked in the water. Peter plainly tells you here that it's not the putting away of the sins of the flesh. Right. Notice, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's the new birth. You were dead in Christ. You're buried with Christ. You're raised in Christ. Now you have a live spirit to God and you have a good conscience. 
that can answer to God. God says, hey, Jim Lucas, walk God. The answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's when you can have an answer of a good conscience toward God when you're dead, buried, when you're raised, when you're resurrected. Literally, yeah, literally. When I'm dead in Christ, when I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit in Christ, after believing the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, I'm literally put in His body. I'm dead, buried, raised with Him. Right. Literally. It's the only way God can do it. It's only, that's the only good thing God has for you in your natural state. He wants you dead. You're his enemy. A year ago, they had a revolution in Egypt. Muslim Brotherhood takes power. They're dancing in the streets. Hey, revolution, revolution. A year later, they're divided, have a civil, getting ready to have a civil war, having another revolution. You know why? Because one side didn't kill all the rest of the other side. That's why. You're an enemy of God. The only thing God wants with you is for you to die. But he offered you salvation. I'm glad that's not all we want with me. Amen. Romans 6, 1 to 11, we see this salvation didn't involve Tom Reed and Jamie Lucas. The salvation included Jamie Lucas dying and becoming Jesus Christ. That's the only thing he's going to accept. A lot of people miss that too. The same Christ that was killed put in the ground ain't even the same Christ that resurrected. He's a new creature. All those born in that image are new creatures in him. Right. Amen. That's what he wanted for us to be dead and be raised in the image of Jesus Christ. That's what that is. Romans 6 to 11 shows you your position in Christ and your experience in Christ. You go down there and read Romans chapter 6, you're going to see something. That there's no doubt in Paul's mind in Romans chapter 6 what your position is. If you're baptized into Christ, you are indeed dead in Christ. This one over here is dead. But then he says, because you're dead and resurrected with him, you'll live like it. You can't get past it, man. You gotta get this in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. God has an order. You've got to get this before you start living right. You have to have the new birth. Therefore, you can't base whether somebody has it or not based on what they're doing. Because the works that please God don't come until after you're born again. Amen. If you read Romans 6 in the first, in the first 10 verses, he uses the word know it time and time again, trying to impart knowledge. Then he tells him to put that knowledge into practice. A man has to be brought to knowledge of these things. That's why he said in Colossians, in Colossians, as you have received Christ, so walk in him. You've got to first receive these things of Christ before you can ever learn to walk in him. It's about bringing your position into a reality in the Christian life. That's what it is. So in me, I have the knowledge, but still can't. <laughs> you can't bring it in practice. Then you, you're brought up to the new birth. That's what I'm trying to bring you to. Colossians 2, 9 to 12. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of God hid bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In him also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. See that? Baptism of the Holy Spirit is equal to being buried. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. The word of God is likened to a sharp 
two-edged sword. Dividing the sun, the soul, and the spirit. Sharp two-edged sword. God comes in with His word. And the sharp two-edged sword. And you believe the gospel, and He comes in here and He performs an operation. And He cuts His flesh. Away from your soul. That's what it means walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by mirror, you're dead. What a minute. I'm breathing, talking, you're dead. You're dead. You're not in the flesh. Did I make something up there, or did God say, putting off the body the sins of the flesh, and later on, through the faith of the operation of God? So it says. Does the Bible not say that God's word is a sharp two-edged sword and dividing asunder? Make anything up. That might sound crazy to Christians that are ignorant of what God's word says, but that's what it says. It's the circumcision that is within. The circumcision that is made without hands. Right. And not in the face. Believing equals circumcision or putting off the sins of the flesh. That's believing. Romans 8, 8 and the 9, 8 to 9 says you're not in the flesh but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwelleth in you, you're not in the flesh. You just got to convince yourself that God don't lie. Believe. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I'm almost finished. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. That's first Corinthians. I said first Corinthians. I said second. I think I said first. First Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Should we uh, pause the video? Can you ever have a prayer for Paul? He was wrong about something. I think everybody else is wrong. Thank you, six, six. <laughs> Romans 6 6. Does that mean that a born again Christian is not body, soul, spirit, spirit, body, soul, and holy spirit? But he's in, in, in the Gospel of John, it says that was born of the spirit, capital is spirit, literally. Something I've never figured out about. Like I told you when we started, I'm not teaching you the whole Bible. <laughs> I'm giving you some guidelines. I'm not going to understand God until the day I die. Everything about it. I want to know more and more. <coughs> more and more every day. First Corinthians, Romans 6, 6, the old man is crucified with him. Knowing this, that our old man, the Bible speaks about the old man, that's another name he uses. Speak about this man, but it's always speaking about in the sense of somebody that's saved. Before they're saved, they're natural, and they get saved, reference to this is reference to the old man. So we come up to the place. We have the old man and the new man. Ephesians 4, 20-24. This is how the Bible speaks about you after you're born again. Ephesians 4, 20-24. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So what you can't get these guys to understand. You can change up the activities of the flesh, the appearance of the flesh, but what Paul's talking about, the things that he's talking about for you to put on, can only put on once you're renewed in the spirit of your mind. So how can a drunk not drinking or any other pet peeve that they have 
be evidence of being renewed in your mind. There's lost people that do that. There's lost people that decide they want to be in good shape so they go join the gym. There's lost people that decide they don't want to be drunks no more so they quit drinking. We're talking about something a whole lot more in informational, something a whole lot more important than clean it up the way the lost world cleans up. Greatest proof of what you're saying is John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking. Christ came both eating and drinking. You can't, you can't tell that they both testified of the truth. It's about, it's out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. Christ said, I'm of the truth, either hear the truth, here is my voice. That's the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit in a man is, the, is an acknowledgement of the truth. All right, Colossians 3, 9 to 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Paul is telling these people in both references that seeing since they have put off this man, they need to act like they've put off that man. But the only way they can act like they've put off that man is to be renewed in the spirit of their mind. We are teaching carnal Christianity or oh, whatever. There ain't nothing like that ever come out of my mouth tonight. God wants you to live and act right, but you're not going to do it until you change the way you think about some things. Amen. Notice in Ephesians and Colossians, the new man is only present once the mind has been re renewed. I'm almost done, y'all. Be patient with me, please. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 to 3. And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Back in chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Once a man is born of the Spirit, before his mind is renewed, he's going to act like the natural man and be referred to as the old man or carnal. So over here, once a man is born again, the Bible's got three ways of referring to him. The old man, carnal man, and the spiritual man. What's the difference? This is natural. The Bible refers to a saved man and it refers to his old man. It's referring to him in the state that he used to be. If it refers to him as a carnal man, it's referring to him as saved, but he's living like the natural man. Or it refers to him as a spiritual man. Now, you have, this is what I'm going to close with tonight. Then I'm going to cover just a little bit here in just about five minutes. When you get here, when your Bible refers to you as the spiritual man, it's going to refer to you as a babe. Don't we all want to please God in our life? Don't we all want to stand before Him one day and Him be pleased with us? Or do we want to live our life taking advantage of His grace and what He's done for us 
and just get by on the least we can do. This should tear our hearts up that the Creator of heaven and earth came down and took on our wicked selves and suffered and died for us and we could care less if we do anything for Him if we're pleasing to Him. I'm not chastising you. I'm the same way. Don't read my Bible like I should. Don't pray like I should. Don't live like I should. I'm not concerned about the loss like I should be. The Bible is going to refer to you as a babe, a little child, children, young men. There are characteristics for each one of these designations that set them apart. You have fathers. You even have elders. And then you have only one man that well, Jesus Christ oh, had the confidence to say, I'm full of age. And that was the Apostle Paul. Full of age. You can meet somebody that's 25 years old that can be full of age. Right. You can meet somebody that's 80 that can be a babe. That's talking about spiritually. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to close here in just a second. The only one I'm going to cover tonight real fast is a babe. Hebrews chapter 5. Now this is so important to understand this here. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 and 14 refers to those that are full of age. The one that's full of age is the one who has had his senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The only way you can have your senses exercised to discern both good and evil is to be well studied in this. Well, I don't know that strong meat belongs to them that are full of age. <coughs> that's meat, that's milk, that's everything. There's bitter herbs in that Bible, stuff that you'll read that'll be bitter to you. There's stuff in there that's sweet. There's stuff in there that's just absolutely necessary. There's stuff in there we read, we read because we enjoy reading. There's stuff in there that we need to read just because we need to read it. Five, twelve to fourteen. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again with being the first principle of the world of God, and are become Amen. such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for his babe, but strong meat belongs to them that are full of that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Trying to get away from being foolish, being having our senses exercised. Foolishness means to be dull, have dull senses. Full of age means your senses are sharp. I used to watch Fox News, man. I used to get all in them debates. I tried O'Reilly to tell. O'Reilly's a good conservative. Now I'm watching on. Smug, arrogant man that thinks you know it all. You couldn't give control of this country to either side and fix one problem you got. So, what's our question? Our, what, our question is spiritual growth. Galatians 5 16 17, walking in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit means to behave in a certain way. The only way to keep from fulfilling the lust of the flesh is to behave in a way that is in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, you have the flesh versus the Spirit in Galatians 5, 16, 17. The flesh lusts against the Spirit. The Spirit lusts against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do what you would. What's it mean to be contrary? Be opposed to 
Whatever your spirit, what your slave lusts for, the spirit of God lusts for, the flesh is going to hate it. Right. Whatever your flesh lusts for, the spirit of God hates it. There's a constant warfare for your mind. The flesh and the spirit are opposed to each other. Verse 18. Almost done, I promise you. I know I told you that so many times. A hundred times already. Huh? What? A hundred times already. Well, I keep lying while I teach them. Galatians 5, is that what I said? This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So many people are going to get upset with this statement. What's right between God and the Holy Spirit might not be right for Chuck and the Holy Spirit. God might call him to go into evangelism, and he might not call Chuck. He calls Chuck to do something else. If you're led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. You're at liberty for you and the Holy Spirit to figure out what it is you need to do to be pleasing to God. Amen. I don't know why that statement scares people, though. It ain't why like the Holy Spirit's going to lead a man to do anything. That's you tell them that, they might think the Holy Spirit's telling them to go kill somebody. People don't trust the Holy Spirit. That's their problem. Amen. They don't believe the Holy Spirit can lead a man in righteousness. Holy Spirit will lead a man into righteousness quicker than the church constitution will. But we're told here, verses 19 21, now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. When you see these works popping up, you don't have to debate it, it's a work of the flesh. They're manifest. They're clearly apparent, they're obvious. If these things are present, there's no debate. If they which do these things cannot enter the kingdom of God. They inherit the day. They do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Alright. Those are the same. No. Which they don't do those things can't inherit the kingdom of God. But actually somebody would say. Those who do those things go to hell. That's yeah. what they read. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it up as we go, man. Fruit of the Spirit, crucified flesh, born again equals crucified Christ living in the Spirit. Living and walking are different things. We are living in the Spirit, so therefore Paul told us to walk in the Spirit. If we're living in the Spirit, we need to walk in the Spirit. Two different things. Every man that's born again by the Spirit of God, he is living in the Spirit. The only question for him is learning how to walk according or in as evidence that he's living in the Spirit. Now, newborn babes, real quick, 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to go over this real fast. I'm done. Look, I'm done. It's the last one. I go through my notes real quick. I don't like them guys that take notes. What would you do if I just got up here and read the Bible to you? Might be bad. Israel stood all day and listened to Ezra and read the law. <laughs> I believe in carefully planning my course through this book. Why? I will be held accountable for it. First Peter 2, where 1 to 3. Now this is important. This is the key. You want to learn how to overcome the flesh and grow as a born again believer? Right here it is. 1 Peter 2 1 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, this is a commandment for you. You're supposed to do this as a newborn babe to use to use a newborn babe as an example for 
what he's telling you to do. That's what he's saying. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. That's the key. It's an affirmative act on our part. We have to desire. You're not going to pick up that Bible and read it if you don't have a desire to pick it up and read it. When you begin to grow, though, you'll have a desire. Promise. But before you can be as a newborn babe, desire the desire in the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. What's he say in the first verse? Something you've got to do first. You know, I've got people that's been saved for 50 years and they've never learned to, how to study this worth a hill of beans. Can't have a decent conversation with you about it. They've never laid aside malice, lines, evil speakings, hypocrisies. That's the big one. Dial. I always thought it'd be really neat to get to heaven one day and for God to say about me the same thing he said about Nathaniel. Was it Nathaniel? Israelite indeed in whom is no God. Israelite indeed in whom is no God. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. Nobody. I wouldn't listen to a guy preaching didn't wear a tie. Why? One dress up, be something that he's not. You gotta get rid of this stuff. Guile, malice, lines, evil speakings, hypocrisies. Where a bunch of people come in and their flesh is rottening off their bones. They got back problems, knee problems. Everyone of them, like Paul always says, you gotta take a shower and wash under your arms, put the odor on, so you don't stink the church out when you walk in. And then they walk in, fancy clothes, put on hair that they're there to impress somebody. That's hypocrisy. I had a woman that would wear pants to church, but wouldn't wear them to church if they were going to be preaching. She would wear them for like a play, a play practice, but she wouldn't wear them for preaching. And she was, that's a guy. That somebody pretending to have more respect for the Word of God than they really do. Because I, I pastored that woman for six years and she had absolutely no respect for anything that book said. I can tell you that. It was all God. She was, she's been so busy tricking people and thinking that she's a great Christian that she's never grown to be a good Christian. Until you put off all that stuff, you'll never grow. You'll never grow. You'll, you'll just keep going around tricking people and putting on a mask. Now what's the key? How do you put off that stuff? Oh man. It's so easy how to lay it out here. Verse 3. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Man, it's taste of the grace of God don't put on airs, buddy. He don't care what you think of him. It's fixed between him and God. No worries. I care what my brother thinks of me. When mine and God's problem is fixed for eternity. That's what these people's problem is. It's full of hypocrisies. They talk bad about each other all the time. They're white in the face. Don't care to hurt you. Pretend or something they're not. They've never tasted the grace of God. I'm not saying they're not saved. All they had to do was believe the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. But they've never had any appreciation for it in their heart. I wonder how they feel if Paul walked in on um, today. But he was right. These things must be laid aside before a person can be as a newborn babe. You have to desire the sincere will of God's Word. You have to long for or wish or crave for the sincere will of God's Word as a newborn babe. Person must be as a newborn babe before they can have a true desire for the sincere milk of the 
the Word of God, because without the sincere milk, they cannot grow. What's sincere? The word simply means genuine or true. You really want to know what the Bible says. You're just not looking to find something to back up your denomination. That's a sincere milk. If you taste that the Lord is gracious. Gracious means compassionate or merciful. Only those who taste the Lord is gracious can lay aside those things. We've been over that. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. You don't have to turn there. I'm done right here. You can give a newborn babe all the milk you want to, but if they've not laid these things aside first, it won't do them a lick of good. That's what it's saying. Verse 1 in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. What are babes? 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. They're carnal. Everything has to do with their flesh. That's why they think they can impress God by putting on a shirt and tie. Everything has to do with their flesh. What it wears, what it eats. Babes are carnal. A baby in Christ is one who lives after the flesh. They're born again, but they haven't begun to war against the flesh. Do you war against the flesh? Do you live defeated? There's many things in my life I've lived defeated to before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confide this in everybody. There was something in my life one time that I would weep my heart of And it was something I had control over. Because the Bible tells us make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And every time this lust would get the best of me, I'd be overcome with guilt. And I'd pray, God, I confess it. I know you forgive me. He tells us if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just forgives our sins. But notice, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Little children, these things write out unto thee, that ye sin not. But if we're confessing sin, truly confessing sin, God's going to be cleansing us of things. And I would confess that with guilt on my heart, and I would confess it. God will give me peace of mind immediately. You know what he'd tell me? I'm not kidding you. It was immediate. Every single time. Get rid of it. That's what I'll do, God. Peace. Was God keeping his promise to cleanse me from unrighteousness? He was telling me what I had to do. Get rid of it. It would give me peace. I have victory in my life over that today. Because I warred against the flesh and I decided it's out. A babe, you know they're no longer a babe because they've begun to war against the flesh. Stop that. I'm sorry guys it took so long tonight.